I know. <laughs> Hold on, let me explain. This is not exactly the ideal opening shot of my Gloriosa Lily, but this is present day me. The rest of the video will be an update and a little bit of how to care guide for Gloriosa Lilies in containers, which I filmed in June and then life got in the way. And then the time had kind of passed and I thought, nah, I'm not going to edit this. I'm not going to upload it. But <laughs> Josh Riebsommer <laughs> left a comment the other day on one of my videos asking how my Gloriosa Lilies are doing. Well, present day, you can see that we are really struggling with the heat. However, we are keeping the hydration going. So if you're interested on the update, let me tell you, it was pretty. I am going to preempt something though. There is some information in this video that I have never ever mentioned before and it is kind of important. Stick with it. I'll get to that information. It's just something I've never talked about, but it is an important detail. And I'm going to now run the video that was filmed in June. And Josh, thank you so much for the question. I was excited. I'm like, yes, I can use this footage. So let's get to it. I hope you enjoy the video. Hi there. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I want to give you an update on my Gloriosa Lily. The tubers were planted back in May. It's been a month, maybe five weeks since I put them into the container. Now, on the left side here, you will see that there are some vines that are a little bit smaller and we're gonna discuss the growth habit. But you'll also see as we go up that these blooms on the left here have already faded. Those are tubers that I left in the container over winter. I was a little bit dubious back in the winter of 2021. I didn't want to lose any tubers, so I took out my other tubers, but these vines were still green when I removed the tubers to store them over the winter, and subsequently they stayed in the container and developed over time all on their own. They came back, thankfully. I had outdoor temperatures of about 9 degrees, maybe 8 degrees Celsius. So they did survive that temperature and it was relatively wet, which always poses a threat for rot. Thankfully, they didn't rot. So of course, they progressed very, very quickly as opposed to the ones that I planted afterwards after bringing them out of my winter storage container. Those are the ones that start with the little narrow leafed one over there all the way to the right. Not on purpose, but I was very happy to then get a subsequent blooming. So stage blooming of my Gloriosa Lily vines because they actually only will bloom once. And then for the rest of the season, they stay green and the leaves absorb the energy and filter that all the way back down to the tubers, very much like any other kind of bulb. So compared to 2021, where I had a beautiful flush of Gloriosa Lily blooms, this year I've got one flush that started has faded and then the vines here on the right have now matured and are starting to bloom out and i have some stragglers right on the right hand side here that took forever to come up and i actually was under the impression that maybe those tubers weren't viable but ta-da i will still have me some more gloriosa lilies in about five weeks when these vines in the middle here have faded now the tubers from these vines that are this big now are three years old. And I'm telling you, the size has increased exponentially. Back in the day when I bought them, I wasn't expecting much of a size jump because I am in southern Spain. My climate isn't tropical. It is just dry and hot during the summer. There is no humidity and it is very wet and cold in the winter. So because of these conditions, I never expected to get vines that can reach up to five meters, which is normal for this Gloriosa lily type. The biggest vine I have right now stands at about two meters tall, which is a size jump of a meter in comparison to last year, when the vines were only reaching this height right here. And I cannot be more pleased because, well, the mature these tubers get, of course, the more impressive the vine becomes and it also starts to branch, something that I didn't have much of last year, but you can see all the branching going on this time around and it's a very, very thick vine that has actually formed through the middle. So the growth habit pretty much is 
put your tuber into the container. Water very, very well. The soil has to be free draining, succulent soil, that kind of soil with a lot of sand in it. And I put slow release fertilizer into the container. Just spread it out a little bit evenly. If you go by half the rate of the fertilizer as per the manufacturer recommendations, that's fine. They don't need that much to develop so well. You don't want them to get too leggy. You want them to grow compact, but also, you know, you want to give them some sustenance so that they can do what they are supposed to do. You will see the vines on the left that are really, really small. Those are brand new tubers forming in the container. Has nothing to do with me. They propagate themselves that way and then they start to grow new little tubers and the first year will only produce small little vines that will not bloom but it is the start of a new tuber the multiplication to the left has begun and then possibly by next year those tubers will be mature enough to bloom and then there's one tuber that i find fascinating which is this one i know it is a gloriosa lily tuber because i have not potted up anything else in this container it has a completely different kind of foliage. It was the biggest tuber that I planted. It was the one that had the red nubbin at the end and I thought that would increase very, very quickly. But it was the last one to come out together with the little ones that are here on the right. The leaves are completely different. So I'm kind of watching this one. It is also a much slower growing tuber and I'm just watching to see what's gonna come of it. I have never seen such narrow leaves on a Gloriosa lily. Maybe it's just a mutation of itself which would be kind of weird because last year I made sure to remove all the unsightly blooms this year I'm leaving them on so that I can see if I can develop any kind of seeds I have plenty of tubers to go around but I would like to know if I can cultivate any gloriosa lily from seed so if I can cultivate a seed pod then that would be awesome and I am not entirely sure that I've achieved that because all this looks pretty pretty dry. There should be little green pods at the end and I wonder if this is like a sterile one but either way there's one thing I want to say. These Gloriosa lilies are toxic. They are toxic to pets so if you have a cat or a dog that chews away on any kind of foliage or is curious about foliage or for example a seed drops and they ingest it then you might see signs of you know the classic signs of vomiting diarrhea and for humans they are also extremely toxic and if you grow gloriosa lilies or want to grow gloriosa lilies then just be aware that the entire plant is toxic not so much in the leaves but if you were to boil the leaves make a brew out of it and drink that as a tea you will get very, very ill. The tubers are extremely toxic and the seeds even more so. In the event that you're not feeling well or your pets are looking a little bit weird, if they are regurgitating a lot, then know that if you have Gloriosa lilies on your property, take them to the vet and tell them that you grow Gloriosa lilies. Us humans will have signs of food poisoning, but being treated for food poisoning will not counteract the toxin of the colchicine alkaloids that are in this plant in abundance. You will definitely have to tell your doctor that you grow Gloriosa lilies and something has happened. The same with your pets. Let the vet know it could be that they swallowed something of a Gloriosa lily just so that they know exactly how to target the treatment. Now that all sounds very very scary I know. Let me tell you something. I have two dogs in my home and one of them is a notorious chewer that goes around the hedge of my property and starts to you know pull out plants. Not once has he had any interest in this container. I've been keeping an eye out on that just to see if there's any interest. So it's possible that animals also know that there is something not quite right with this plant and for that reason they don't touch it. Their natural instinct kicks in but you know I wanted to put it out there when we talk about plants. It's best to know if they're toxic to pets or if it's very very toxic to human beings as well. And I'm not talking just a small little symptom of a stomach ache. It is very, very serious if you were to ingest, for example, the seeds. They look very much like coriander seeds and, you know, terrible things can happen if somebody were to make you a tea 
you're thinking you're getting coriander tea and it is actually gloriosa lily seeds that have been brewed so i'm just putting it out there because in all of my other videos about gloriosa lily i've always ever talked about the fascination i have for them how much i love them how much they remind me of where i come from where they used to grow in the wild and up and around everything they're pretty invasive but i've never ever addressed the toxin and the lethal effect of ingesting any part of this plant it is worth it for me to grow this one. She grows really, really fast. Her blooms are beautiful and showy. The buds are gorgeous. Then they color up. They look like little cones. And then bit by bit, the petals and sepals start to flatten out and curl up, exposing beautiful flames flickering because they also have that gorgeous yellow margin along the ruffles of the petals and sepals. They last maybe three days, four days, each bloom, heavy, heavy watering is required during this phase of their development because of how fast they grow and how much sustenance they need to be pumping up, not only developing new tubers, but also getting hydration up to the top of the plant. If the watering is a little bit too reduced, then the blooms will only last like a day or two. At this stage of its development, this whole container is evenly moist. Because of the slow release fertilizer, I don't add any more fertilizer in there, but I do make sure that I maintain the container moist. So that for me in my current climate with temperatures reaching up to 30 degrees Celsius is a liter and a half of plain water every single day. And I pour it in very slowly so that there's an even distribution throughout the pot. I don't go at it with a hose, otherwise that soil being so loose and so so free draining will go everywhere because it's just not compact enough to hold up against a hose. I would much prefer to have these out growing in my garden now that I can somewhat protect them from the winter and get my tubers to grow again, but it is not my property. Otherwise, these would be in the ground all the time. Growing them in a container makes them a little bit more volatile to the conditions of the winter. There's not as much insulation around a container as there would be if they were to be in the ground, die back naturally, and then come back in spring. And that is why I've started to be very hesitant about leaving them in the container because they will rot very, very easily. The tubers are very brittle, very fleshy. Their only protection is a very flaky, brownish coating which easily flakes off once the tuber is dry. So preventing rot is important if you are to grow these in a container. You could leave the tubers in the container and bring the container somewhere protected inside until the temperatures rise again to about 10-11 degrees Celsius and this way you don't have to lift them at the end of the season. For convenience sake that is perfect. I don't do that because I don't have a place to store my container indoors otherwise trust me I would just take the container inside <laughs> and leave it at that. There is no fragrance on these blooms at all. Their beauty is purely visual and for me a nice happy memory from bygone days where I used to just see them as a weed but still love the blooms. I have absolutely no pest problems with these either. Sometimes they can get some little worms or they can get some larvae growing on them. Caterpillars would like these as well. But I think that our European pests aren't exactly accommodated to these because even if they were to start in on them, that toxin would take them out. I have not seen this plant in any way, shape or form be attacked by any European pests. Neither have I in Kenya. So <laughs> probably the toxin is its biggest protection. You don't have to be in a super hot climate to grow these. These can be grown also in the Northern Hemisphere. If the summers reach around 25 degrees Celsius, a balcony will do nicely as well. And once they finish blooming, that's it. There's just a lot of greenery and the rest is then being redirected down to the tubers for them to grow big, strong, ready for the next season. And only when the vine has completely died back and comes out of the pot super easy without having to pull hard, it'll be brown, it'll be brittle. That is when you know it's either time to bring them in to store them or back off on the watering until such a time that the temperatures rise again.
The tubers, in my case, that stayed in the container, they had to deal with all the winter climate, all the rain, all the cold, because I felt safe enough I had tubers in storage. But if you're going to leave your tubers in the container and you're concerned about it getting too wet, then just leave the container outside, but somewhere under cover where it won't get constantly battered by rain. Seeing as I grow a lot of orchids, <laughs> a lot, mainly orchids, oh, let me correct that, only orchids, <laughs> This is a fun plant for me to grow because it grows so fast, whereas orchids can take 12, 13 months to rebloom. Should nothing go wrong, by the time I had these tubers potted up, it's five weeks later and I have got a beautiful bloom spectacle. <laughs> it makes for a wonderful change from growing orchids to see a plant just burst into growth and then into beautiful flower. <laughs> I hope that this video was helpful. If you had any questions about growing Gloriosa lilies in containers and about the temperature range at which they can tolerate being in containers, meanwhile also being outside. And I didn't want to put a damper on this beautiful, rewarding vine by bringing up its lethal side effects. Should any of the plant be ingested, but for a video like this, I thought it was super important to finally mention that there's a little bit of a downside to this plant. And just in case the question arises, the simple touch has no effect at all. If I were to lick my fingers now, it wouldn't affect it either. You literally have to ingest it. It has to hit your system for it to be that toxic. Other than that, enjoy a Gloriosa lily in your garden. Bring a little bit of a tropical vibe to your balcony or to your south facing yard. You won't regret it. Just want to add something on before I forget. What you do need, because these are vines, is a little bit of a trellis, a support thing if you're going to grow them in containers. Something that they can climb up on, at least to give them a head start. Eventually, they will do the rest of supporting each other on their own because the leaves at the end start to elongate and start to curl. They are reaching for another support structure where they will then curl around and grab onto that. And in that way, they hold themselves upright I always feel like they're holding hands <laughs> it's it's just so cute it is very interesting to watch if for example you can put your container up against a tree you're pretty much okay without using a trellis because they will deal with it themselves by reaching via the leaves for support really appreciate you watching this video thank you so very very much and now it's back to the orchids <laughs> have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition, though, please, that you do stay safe and take care. Bye.